proud to sound modern um, lecture. We do this as a public lecture, free as you know. Um, I'm Tamara Miller, Dean of the Library. And uh, this series of lectures uh, is offered to you through the generosity of a number of donors who choose to remain anonymous. So I won't bother embarrassing them. They know who they are. Um, the Bud Lilly Trout and Salmonid um, Initiative supports these lectures and also a collection, I should say a preeminent collection, of manuscripts, books, now almost uh, 8,000 volumes or more, on all aspects of the study and enjoyment of trout. Um, this was the brainchild of the former dean, the emeritus Bruce Morton, who is with us tonight. And um, I encourage all of you, if you have not done so, to come to the library, <coughs> visit the collection, use the collection. Um, the initiative honors Bud Lilly. Some of you may know Bud, he couldn't be with us this evening. But Bud has been a tireless supporter of the library and the collection. And as many of you know, he is an advocate and friend of trout and the preservation of their waters. This evening's lecture will be followed by a reception, which you all walked past, including trout cookies, I might add. <laughs> as well as, I think, something called salmon ch chateau wine. Um, and we encourage you to stick around after the lecture, enjoy the refreshments, and continue the conversation. Tomorrow, we will have an informal gathering with Dr. Hoffman in the library for students. So those students among us here tonight, or you can invite your friends, 10 o'clock in the Special Collections Reading Room. Um, and as an enticement, light refreshments will also be offered there. Um, I want to take a moment to thank the people who make this possible. This event is the result of some hard work by Robin Francis, Pamela Schultz, Sandra Feige, Patricia Gleason, and Michael Hodges, all of the library staff. So thank you very much, guys. I especially want to thank Paul Schillerian. Paul is a noted historian, the author of many books, and we are honored in the library to have him as our very first and only scholar in residence. Um, Paul's roles are many, but he is invaluable to us in growing and improving our Yellowstone collections and our Trout Salmonic collection. So I invite Paul to the podium to introduce our speaker. And thank you. He's also a continuing member of the Graduate Center for Medieval Studies at the University of Toronto. Um, Richard's work, I have to just sort of reinforce some things that are in the little description on the program. Richard's work as a medievalist has ranged broadly across intellectual, economic, and ecological realms. Better to understand the human relationship with this very elusive thing we call nature. And, and what a wealth of information and ideas he's delivered in, in a vivid interdisciplinary uh, portrayals of how even a thousand years ago in Europe we began to overhaul entire continental ecosystems with dramatic and complex consequences that we still struggle to comprehend. Uh, among many other projects, Richard is currently completing an environmental history of medieval Europe 
to be published by Cambridge University Press. Uh, among the honors that Richard has accumulated for this extraordinary body of work are the Alice Hamilton Prize from the American Society for Environmental History, a York University Dean's Award for Outstanding Contributions in Teaching, and the Herbert Baxter Adams Prize awarded by the American Historical Association. But what matters for fishermen, uh, especially the fishermen among us here tonight, is Richard's service uh, to the study of angling history. In the past 30 years, almost as a sideline to his major work in environmental history, Richard has produced a milestone series of articles and book chapters, and a most remarkable book, that have done more to shape our understanding of the cultural origins of our sport than anyone else ever. Let me try to put Richard in perspective this way on those treasure shelves of the Trout and Salmonid collection that Tamara mentioned. Uh, there are thousands of splendid books about fish and fishing, uh, including some of mine that I like to think are fairly splendid. <laughs> but only a small, very small handful of these texts exemplify the most rarefied level of erudition. That finest above and beyond uh, level of scholarship that comes along so rarely. I have, in my own personal mental list, I have four titles uh, of that quality. Uh, I waffle about others, but there are four that I'm sure of. The first is Thomas Westwood and Thomas Satchel's magnificent Bibliotheca Piscatoria. Uh, Richard's really good at Latin if you want to hear that said better. <laughs> it was published in London in 1883. The second is William Radcliffe's Fishing from the Earliest Times, published in London in 1921. The third is John MacDonald's The Origins of Angling, published in New York in 1963. And the fourth is Richard Hoffman's Fisher's Craft and Lettered Art. And I have a note here that says, wave book around. <laughs> it's a visual name. <laughs> Which was published in Toronto in 1997. Of these four, Richards is by far the best model for the student who wishes to learn how to think and write deeply, creatively, and importantly about fishing as a vital element of human culture. So please join me in welcoming tonight's Bud Lilly Trout and Salmonid Lecture, Dr. Richard Hall. unresolved in my earlier work on the history of angling. Uh, this I do now in light of more general research into how our pre-industrial European ancestors, predecessors, uh, operated in their natural world, and especially with aquatic ecosystems. She or not her land are mit einem Feder an auf Fink Eschen und Fürchen, die will sie las. She on other land are fisher mit dem Angel fingt, da er stund auf bosen blanken Beinen durch die Kühle in lüttersnellen Bachke. About 1217 to 1223 era, epic poet Wolfram von Eschenbach <laughs> depicted a fictive noble youth, she on other land are, a sign of the Grail dynasty, on an outing with his girlfriend, Sigune, cousin to King Arthur. While she sat on the bank reading and playing with a dog, he waded bare-legged in a cool, clear stream to catch trout and grayling with a feder angel, medieval German, for an artificial fly. This may be the oldest depiction of a leisured fly fisher catching trout. The scene of Schoenacher Leonard Angling poses a curious historical problem of understanding, not in our terms, which is deceptively easy, but in terms of medieval culture, the evolving behaviors and ideas of Europeans 
between the 6th and the 16th centuries. What is going on here? In shaping an answer, I start from three essential components. Fly, play, trout. And then move out to the broader histories of medieval fisheries and concepts of outdoor sport. I want there to observe two historic phenomena, how the knowledge of the natural world embodied in Shionakalanda's fishing drew on now nearly effaced traditional experience of nature by people who fished for a living as work. And secondly, I want to see how in last medieval centuries, some selected parts of this knowledge began to be moved from storage and memories and transmission by voice to texts, written, soon printed, meant to define play. Of the fly, we can say nothing for much of our millennial period, as no known mention of soul fishing occurs in the thousand years after Roman essayist Alien, circa 170-230 current era, who provided a now well-known but unique hearsay description of Macedonians binding red wool and wax-colored feathers to a hook to catch speckled fish that were eating a certain insect. Then, a thousand years after that, Wolfram's sudden portrayal of the sporting young fly fisher Shionatolander and that same author's barely earlier allusion to the deceitful Federango itself initiated a slow rise in medi late medieval references to fly fishing. From then on, the artificial fly may be thought a reasonably well documented practice for catching trout and grayling in at least four European regions upland Central Europe, England, Northern Italy, and Spain. Medieval fly fishing in Central Europe is next after Wolfram, so far traceable through passing references in legal and political records, such as the right confirmed in 1360 to a householding couple in Lombach of the Crown in Upper Austria to fish with the fly even outside their regular license on the local abbey's waters. A political tract falsely attributed to the late Holy Roman Emperor Sigismund circulated in 1439 at the Reformist Church Council of Basel. It called for free access to small waters for passage and for fishing with the Peter Hunt. Hermann Heinpol, the legal historian who ferreted out these references, argues, I think cogently, that fly fishing was here understood as the ultimate right of access for common people to fish with their lord's private water for a subsistence meal. But some later ordinances of Swiss and Austrian origin also put the artificial fly in the repertoire of people making a living from fishing. Since the 1490s, moreover, several surviving German language collections of fish catching advice <laughs> include re recipes for making feta as well as other kinds of baits. Within a century, those German sources now know provide more than, provide nearly a hundred different fly patterns and even explicit statements of imitative theory. Pioneering Swiss naturalist Conrad Gessner reported in two passages of his 1558 Latin volume on fishes what he had found in a sadly now lost German manuscript booklet. Uh, certain skillful fishers, said Gessner, fabricate diverse kinds of worms and winged insects from feathers of birds in various seasons of the year and place such bait on the hook for grailing. And trout, they deceive chiefly by semblances placed on the hook which very nearly recall those flies or insects in which all fish take delight. They are, however, changed for the various seasons of the year. The booklet offers six flies of the month, covering April through September for each of the two species. Unlike the German, the next oldest run of evidence for medieval fly fishing, that in English, comes exclusively from such manuscript and eventually printed advice of mid to late 15th, 15th century date. Besides various natural, prepared, and even magical baits for trout and other species, a trout called Menachina piscio, medicines for fishes, in on an Oxford Bodleian manuscript, uh, anticipates the thinking of Gessner's booklet. And if ye fish for him in the leaping time, ye must double your hook with the feathers of a peacock, or with the feathers of a partridge, or with the feathers of a wild duck. And you must look what color that the fly has that, is the, that the trout leapeth after. And the same color must the feathers be, and the same color must the silk be, of for to bind 
the Federalists to your hook. Similar views are differently expressed in a roughly contemporary tract in British Library Manuscript, Harley 2389. Like others without fly fishing, these mid-century English tracts are both older and independent of other English textual traditions, which eventuated in the well-known anonymous treatise of fishing with an angle, printed by Winkie de Bird in the second book of St. Albans in 1496. The dozen named patterns for dumps there, recommended for trout and grayling, not, I point out, found in earlier manuscripts, remain until 1620, the last new English references to the artificial flood. While modern ethnography makes a long tradition of indigenous fly fishing in northern Italy highly likely, just across the Alps from the lands of the feeder on, neither records of practice nor manuals of advice establish its medieval historicity. This rests for now on a single work of art, a triptych altarpiece, Jacopo de Bazzano, painted for the parish church of Borgo del Carapa near Treviso, it's in the Veneto, in 1538. A terrible photo from a bad color print. Okay? Sorry, we're still trying to get into this church. Uh, the later well-known Venetian artist was reared, trained, and still lived in nearby Bazzano, a town on the glacier Alpine-fed River Brenta. One panel of his altarpiece depicts San Zeno, a late Roman missionary and bishop of Verona. Because a part of Zeno's subsequent legend had him catch fish to feed the poor, his late medieval iconography customarily shows him with a fish dangling from his pastoral staff. Jacopo, however, whose realism is commonly acknowledged, depicted the saint in full pontificals, holding a long, thin rod with a line from which dangled three artificial flies, one with a grayling still attached. You can see the grayling. Now, the flies are almost impossible to see, but the people who've actually worked on this, it really is there. Sadly, the well-known lack of Italian scholarship in medieval and early modern rural life means no one has looked seriously into local legal records or manuscript collections for traces of the same sort of evidence we have from England and the German-speaking lands. Somebody could do that. It'd be a really neat Renaissance history project. Finally, what was plainly a well-established Spanish tradition for fly fishing for trout burst into the historical record with Fernando Basotos de Lobo, a literary discussion between a noble hunter and a commoner fisher printed in Zaragoza in 1539. I've treated ecological and cultural aspects of Basurko's work elsewhere. My concern at the moment is simply his clear portrayal of fly fishing for trout. Having in the practical section of the dialogue treated tackle, baits, and other species, the fisher tells how he had caught trout using natural insects and then goes on to their imitations. In translation, I'm quoting. The feather of the capon or duck, or of another bird called a bunyao, is a very excellent bait for trout in the months of April, May, June, July, and August in clear water and swift streams. But note that the feather by itself is worth nothing if it is not tied to the body of some flies made of the same color as silk, at times yellow, at times brown, at other times black, because these are the colors of the same flies that the trout eat in the streams evening and morning. And you should know that in different months there are different flies in the streams. And to find out in those rivers where there are trout, you must put yourself by the stream and look at the color of the fly that flies there and take it alive. With the feather, one must fish, as I said, in swift streams without lead and without float, but with the feathers alone, throwing down the stream and going up the stream with reasonable speed. So the feather goes to the top of the water, the upper part of the stream, for in such a manner the trout eat real flies, and so we fool them with artificial ones. And that's moscas artificialis. I mean, there's no question what he's talking about. <laughs> in a technical sense, this considerable medieval record of fly fishing, established in three and perhaps four European linguistic cultures, thus achieves its epitome in these explicit and independent statements of imitative theory, found in Medicina Piscium, Harley 2389, and the printed books by Basorto and Gessner. Nothing in that record, however, ever offers fly fishing as a novelty or invention. On more than purely literary grounds, then, we may surmise that the technique practiced by Schionacolander was known to at least some early 13th century audiences. But as a play, yes, fishing as a recreational activity, one being practiced by individuals who, like Schionacolander, plainly did not need to fish for a living, 
has a broader, if obscure and neglected history throughout the poorly documented medieval centuries before and the ever better reported ones after 1200. <coughs> Emperor Louis the Pious, son of Charlemagne, set aside governmental affairs in summer 831 and again 834 to enjoy hunting and fishing around Remiremont in the Vosges. A fairy tale prince, Rotley, whose romance survives only in mid 11th century fragments, twice went with friends to a lake to go fishing for fun. Ludon aque jocarentur, those are Latin words for play. The latter fictive characters caught their fish with a seemingly magical powder called buglosa, in fact, well recorded for an herb with chemical properties paralyzing the fish. <laughs> a real mid 12th century young noble, the perhaps reluctant cleric Guy of Bazoche, wrote home to his mother that he was dedicated to his games and studies. He's in Paris at Florida University. In a somewhat later letter, he wrote to friends that having left Paris due to some scandal, he had just spent more than a year at his uncle's small rural ca castle uh, near Rupigny, where he alternated devotion to his studies with what he calls play in the out of doors at lighter games, when, uh, namely hunting, fowling, and fishing. When the season is right and he pleases, quote, to fool fishes by various means, he used hook and line, nets of the same, to take seven local fish varieties and so refresh a mind weary from the world in intellectual effort. You can skip over some other uh, uh, high medieval anglers and point out that by the late 1300s, an association of fishing with the elite court society on the continent opened the story. And this is more or less contemporary with us with the Guy de Bazoche, uh, funny little man, little gloss of the manuscript. Um, by the late 1300s, an association of fishing with the elite court society on the continent is further visible in depictions and reports of high-ranking, actual high-ranking men and women enjoying the activity. Sketches and palace murals dating between the 1360s and 1410s, some of them no longer extant, in Verona, the castle at Pavia, and at Castle Roncolo, which is near Bolzano in the South Tyrol, show men and women in their own costume angling and catching fish in nets. So did a tapestry commissioned in 1402 by Queen Isabeau of France, and a panel painting of the court of Holland on an angling outing. The Queen Dowager of Aragon fished for Shad at Tortosa in 1382, and as Doña Blanca, Infanta of Navarre, traveled to Valladolid in 1440 to wed the heir to the throne of Castile, the Count of Haro entertained her for three days with jousting, hunting, and fishing in a pond he had specially stocked with large trout and marble for her pleasure. Exceeding all of the aforementioned in both noble rank and enthusiasm for fishing was the Emperor Maximilian I, 1493-1519. Concerned for the aquatic resources of his lands, in 1504, he instructed his hunting office to assemble reports of his fishmeister, Marquis Fritz, to compile a fisheries book for Tyrol and Goritza, so he could evaluate, quote, such fisheries regarding use and pleasure. And the two words here are mutz, that's use, and gust, that's pleasure. The finished product was organized by regions of bodies of water and embellished with six illustrative scenes of Max and his court hunting and fishing. Each of the many entries identifies the fish varieties available in the water and indicates whether it might better serve the emperor's table or his pleasure. The lake at Ambras, with its pike, carp, bream, and tinch, was mustiger, merrier, because its vicinity to the Innsbruck residence meant it could be fished with a net as a pastime while you were hunting deer. It's the original cat for blast. Um, <laughs> the Hedersbach at Wiesen by Rin, quote, has good trout, and the, trout may, the prince may have fun there fishing with a small hand net and an angling rod. Tyrolean officials plainly thought their ruler would enjoy fishing with everything from saints and traps to rod and line, and for species from gudgeon and minnow to grayling, trout, and pike. Angling, however, is mentioned only as a means to pursue lust. Courtiers shown with rod in hand wave it over the water on the line, without weight on the line as speckled fish leap about. Maximilian further displayed his own most proficient in his autobiographical vice training, where woodcuts specially commissioned for his personal copy show the emperor angling in the midst of other fishing activities. Maximilian, Schionatorlander, and some other nobles may have enjoyed catching trout and other fishes, 
but many other medieval Europeans also had some familiarity with this particular fish. Present-day taxonomists endlessly debate the lumping or splitting of the many highly variable and diverse European members of genus Salvo, Salvo not Salar. As today, speakers of vernac medieval vernaculars confronted with spotted, torpedo-shaped freshwater fishes employ that most some variant on the local word for trout. We shall here do the same. Um, the bigger ones are the three key uh, defined as subspecies of um, Salmon Trota, uh, the sea trout, the uh, brook trout, as the Germans would call them, and uh, the lake trout, uh, the lacustrine. The others are some important uh, other subspecies, and I particularly call attention to the top of the one on your right, which is Salmon Trota Carpiona, uh, which is indigenous only to Lake Garda in northern Italy, but is going to become part of our story later on. It's worth noting that for early medieval texts rarely differentiate among generic Pisces, these cases, and this insouciance of biodiversity could long linger. Nevertheless, we can quickly illustrate the broad utilitarian, utilitarian categories of food objects, economic resources, and rare rooted references, whereby medievals could deal with what they called trout. Medieval Europeans ate trout all across the fish's wide range. Trout bones occur among the food remains and food wastes, fish remains and food wastes from sites of early and central medieval date in northern Italy, along the southern Baltic coast at its hinterland, northwestern France, at the Cluniac Abbey of La Cherite sur Loire, central England, and several monastic and lay sites in Ireland. <laughs> Even from the 13th to 15th centuries, on which less zoo archaeology has been done, trout remains have turned up in latrines of castles from English County Durham to the Danube below Vienna, and urban sites from Otranto on Italy's heel to Orléans in central France. This is despite the elevated fat content of salmonid bones, which reduces their survival in most archaeological contexts. And secondly, the difficulty of identifying archaeological salmonid bones to the specific level, which inclines archaeozoologists just to label large specimens salmon and small ones trout. Um, when they get in East Central Europe where there's no salmon, they have trouble with big ones. They decide they're hooking properly. Uh, written records agree. For instance, as early as the 6th century, a Greek-trained physician was advising the Frankish king Tudoric that trout and perch were the fishes most suitable for human food. Toward the opposite chronological extreme, the Parisian householder, who in 1395 prepared for his young wife the homemaking manual called Le Ménagier de Paris, included a buying guide and recipe for trout. Trouts. Their season begins in May. Correction. Their season is from March until September. The white ones are good in winter, the red in summer. The best of the trout is the tail, and of the carp is the head. The trout, which has a palate with two little black hollows, is red. Trout are cooked in water and plenty of red wine, which ought to be eaten with camelina, which is a spicy sauce, and served in portions of two-finger size. Uh, on meat days, serve trout as pate on large strips of bacon. It sounds pretty good. <laughs> Knowledge of trout is a resource to be exploited and protected is implicit in the estate survey done in 862 for the monastery of Bobbio, which received rent payments and trout eel from fishery in Lake Garda. Garda had been famous for Roman times and would still be in the Renaissance for large endemic lake dwelling carpione, sometimes called Salmo Trota Carpio. If you get Italian carpione, they aren't carp. They're lake dwelling specific trouts. Um, and Bobbio has it coming in his rents in 862, and probably for a thousand years thereafter. The right of ordinary citizens to catch trout in particular was guaranteed in several 11th and 13th century royal charters for self-governing communes in northern Castile. Special but plainly also pragmatic appreciation of this distinctive animal comes through a Florentine statute of 1450, restricting fishing in the Cosentino Mountain District southeast of the city, quote, wherein the rivers and waters there present are appropriated and made those fish which are called trout and truly noble fishes they are. It will perplex only those unfamiliar with the curious gap between medieval experience of the natural world and the writing of many medieval intellectuals to observe that learned references to trout are not rare but have little to say. Early compendia of natural history offer only etymological, allegorical, and uh, dietary remarks. Even mid-13th century Dominican theologian and Christian Aristotelian natural philosopher Albert the Great 
whose section on fishes in his circa 1260 encyclopedic De Animalibus on animals combines classical references and acute observation of more than 100 aquatic creatures still somehow dis disappoints the trout hunter. True tide are river fish living in the fast caves of the mountains. They have scales and reddish flesh in summer like the salmon, but are in winter white and less tasty. On the back are yellow, red, and black spots. Not wrong, but certainly thin. We must await the pioneer ichthyologists of the early 16th century, <coughs> Conrad Gessner among them, for a thorough discussion of the biological as well as cultural features of European fishes, trout among them. Nevertheless, it is plain that for more than a millennium, diverse Europeans were well aware of trout as one sort of fish dwelling in certain habitats and subject to human capture and consumption. So how did these three widespread, if sparsely recorded traditions, knowledge of an aquatic creature, a form of social play, and a peculiar capture technique coexist and connect in medieval European culture? The rest of this talk will try to establish some links. First, a brief narrative of evolving medieval European fisheries will reveal people whose work in the natural world engendered deep familiarity with local aquatic life, trout included, and ways to capture them. Then I'll discuss how the traditional knowledge those people one possessed flowed into an evolving concept of sport among medieval literate elites. I'll not hear dwell on how the practice emerged in Western Christianity which forbade consumption of meat on a weekly and seasonal basis about 135 days, 35% of the year, but permitted fish as a meat substitute. This custom shaped regular and pattern consumption of fish by all who could afford it. The archaeological and written record confirms medieval Europeans ate fish throughout, with locally available varieties, meaning overwhelmingly freshwater and diagonal species, dominant everywhere into the 11th century. And thereafter, a slow, piecemeal increase in consumption of marine fishes in durably preserved form. Where possible, however, everyone always preferred fresh fish, and for most, that meant those, like trout, taken in local fresh water. Changing medieval patterns of effective demand for fish motivated three successive institutional forms of fisheries, subsistence, small-scale artisanal, and later large-scale commercial. While the latter evolved in a marine environment irrelevant to our present discussion, subsistence and artisanal fisheries were the primary modes of exploitation on the inland waters inhabited by trout and other freshwater species. Their growth occurred within a larger pattern of medieval socioeconomic development. In the earlier Middle Ages, into the 12th, 13th centuries, subsistence fisheries predominated, and some remained locally important well into modern times. In the subsistence fishery, the catch fed the household of the fisher. Whether he was his patriarchal head, we call that direct subsistence, or a servant supplying a larger establishment, indirect subsistence. Records of fishing activities and fishes consumed indicate that fishing for the consuming household exploited local waters and fish populations everywhere. Direct subsistence fishing was a part-time seasonal activity of peasant households and communities who had access, not always formally legal, <coughs> to local aquatic resources. Indirect subsistence fed local elite households with the Lord's resources, increasingly conceived as his property, using the labor of subordinates whether servile peasants or household servants fishing part-time or full-time specialist fishers. What we can learn about subsistence fishers of both types establishes their deep empirical familiarity with local organisms and ecosystems. A direct subsistence fishery was, for example, practiced by households in an early 11th century settlement of peasant knights on La Paladrudes in the Alps north of Grenoble. This lake contained and contains trout and char, as well as cypridids, perch, and pike. Annual rings and scales and vertebrae recovered from middens establish about half of the fish in the 11th century were taken in spring and about a third of them in fall. 
And a welcome surprise, underwater archaeologists also found bronze hooks, iron fish spears, and cork floats, plus stone and ceramic weights for nets. So a wide choice of equipment for different situations. Cairnse Abbey, an 8th century foundation in the Bavarian Alps, acquired by 1291 full lordship and the entire fishing rights over the 72 meter deep, three by seven kilometer dimensions lake, its tributaries and its outlet. <clears throat> Already in the 11th century and still in the 15th and 16th, the Abbey employed a half dozen full-time fishers to fish the lake for lake trout. Now that's safe for them, it's the lake dwelling brown trout. Uh, white fishers and cyprinids using boats and various specialized nets and traps. Those fishers knew in December and January, for instance, how to find the schools of whitefishes spawning at certain bottom locations in 10 to 20 meter depth. And these guys don't have depth finders. Uh, other subjects who paid a license fee could go catch crayfish, trout, and sculpin and sell them to the monastery at set prices. 100 trout angled from brooks received 34 kreutzer and four loaves of heavy bread. 100 from the larger Mangfall River earned 43 kreutzer and four breads. <laughs> Any fish longer than a forearm had to be offered for sale to the monks, who for trout, pike, grayling, buchen, or barbel paid four price of the pound. One record from the economic manager's office indicates where the trout were thought best around Whitsunday, which almost always fall, falls in May, uh, when certain flowers bloomed and long bugs appeared in the lake. The term is langamuka. That translates as long bugs. You know, when the right bugs are in the surface, that's when you go after the trout. The trout started to spawn around uh, St. Bartholomew, late August, and remained in brooks up to Martini at the end of November. Abbey officials heavily fined people from a village in the next valley who covertly crossed the poached lake trout that were spawning in upper reaches of the main tributary. I mean, and these are fish like that, and they're up in stuff that's no wider than this. <clears throat> it's only about that deep in August that you've seen them. So these guys, people went into it spears to poach them. Uh, the Abbey didn't like that at all. Uh, <laughs> Management clerks also compiled, likely between 1497 and 1505, a book of fishing advice, which contained, besides many recipes for natural and prepared paste baits, paste baits for local fishes, more than 50 patterns for fader armor. About in the 10th century, records from several European regions also began to show people catching fish for sale to nearby consumers. So practicing the kind of small-scale commercial fishing we now call artisanal. Local markets for fish were an integral, indeed often precocious element in the early rise of the exchange sector, which expanded during the 11th and 12th centuries. Artisan fishers first appeared at inland and coastal sites with access to <coughs> consuming centers, especially emerging towns such as Ravenna, Lincoln, or Worms. From there, people described as making their living from fishing spread to lesser places. Well-documented later cases confirm that especially specialized providers of indirect subsistence to lords found other people prepared to pay for fish the lord thought surplus. Those potential consumers of cash in their purses were mainly townsfolk, not peasant farmers. Artisanal fishing was one household enterprise among others rarely the predominant speciality of whole settlements. Like subsistence fishers, artisans targeted familiar local fish varieties with their selection from a common inventory of basic capture techniques, from small-scale baited hooks or pot gear, whoops, eh, <coughs> to large weirs and crew served nets. Big seasonal catches they kept alive in tanks, cages, or ponds, or preserved with simple short-run methods. Both groups likewise remain subject to constraints from a lord and or their community. <clears throat> Village bylaws regulated access to aquatic as to other commons, and often forbade sale outside the community, or at least ensured first refusal rights to local consumers. Early on, professional fishers from a town or region formed, as did other crafts, associations of mutual interest. It was the collective corporation of fishers who negotiated in 943 with the Bishop of Ravenna a monopoly on market access. And so to all the fishers of Worms, who in 1106 
provided whole salmon each year to the bishop and count in return for control over that fish market. Such guilds then regulated themselves under municipal or territorial authority. Fishers at Tulum on the Danube, for instance, could each employ only one helper, and had each Christmas to declare for the coming year whether they would fish with a seine, a trap net, or open one. The 32 Fischmeister on the lower crown themselves declared their ordinances in 1418, including a ban on taking small pipe hook and or trout between 24 April and the 13th of October. Like subsistence fishing, artisans supplied markets, provided fresh catches from nearby waters, and only slowly also animals taken at more distant times or places. But even well into the 1200s, the trout herring or sardines kept to eat later mostly came from fishers' home waters and were consumed in quantity only a few score kilometers away. The learned Milanese Bonavessant de la Riva wrote to praise his native city. He remarked how fishers of the area who specialized in lake, river, or stream fishing brought to its market every manner of fish, trouts, lake trouts, chub, tench, grayling, eel, and lamprey, while crayfish were especially appreciated during Lent. Other fishes eventually did reach markets across wider spaces, as the marine varieties which fast pet train relays got from Norman ports to 13th century Paris in some 36 to 48 hours. Farther than that, roughly 150 kilometers, however, pre-industrial technology could not move a fresh product. Slow boats <coughs> carried rind carrying dried cot or barreled salmon up the Seine to the Paris market. City fishmongers typically organized such transport to pool regional catches and balance seasonal abundances of different varieties. Many also maintained live storage facilities, and some helped capitalize fishers by advance purchase of their catches. MSU Library Salmonic Collection has recently acquired an early edition of the booklet on Roman fishes, De Romanis Piscibus Nibelus, wherein humanist physician Paolo Jovio described the fish market of Papal Rome in 1524. Among the 43 varieties available fresh, Jovio provides erudite knowledge of ancient Salmon, ancient, ancient admiration for trout, and remarks on the diverse phenotypes that were present in his own time. One kind is this kind of speckles, one kind is that kind of spots, that sort of stuff. Uh, those trout came salted too, among which the more discerning palate, especially enjoy the carpeone from Lake Garda, processed in the open air. This townsman's fishes have markings and taste, but no known habits, habitat, or means of capture. They come in a market, end up on the table. Over time, increases in human numbers and economic development changed parameters for medieval relations with aquatic systems. Purposeful and unintended anthropogenic pressures together impact in water quality, habitat, and biodiversity. When people cleared woodlands for permanent arable fields across large areas of Europe, they destabilized many hydraulic regimes. About 1300, an acute Alsatian chronicler commented on the appearance within his own lifetime of more erratic seasonal stream flow in the Vosges. Barrier dams built to drive water mills on lower water streams, fragmented riverine habitats. Contemporaries observed negative effects on migratory fishes in Atlantic salmon rivers and elsewhere. As, for example, the River Sarka in 1210, where most likely trout or shad were being barred access by dams from Lake Garda, and the local count ordered their removal. <coughs> Accelerated erosion siltation episodes coincident with phases of regional arable expansion Subsequent changes in land use are visible from England and France eastward to Poland. Even eutrophication from dense, mainly urban populations can be detected archaeologically on the Bodens beside late medieval constants. Contemporary observers in the Low Countries, in Tuscany, and in Central Europe blame fish kills on toxic effluents from, for instance, processing hemp and flax or washing metallic ores. While such insults harm natural productivity, rising human numbers and wealth increase pressures of demand, provoking price increases. Though fish never provided cheap calories, rising prices indicated demand in excess of traditional supply and motivated both more fishing effort and competitive conflicts over resource access. 
King Philip IV of France in 1289 bemoaned the depletion of each and every river and waterside of our realm, large and small. While the best independent confirmations of the king's diagnosis refer to anadromous and estuarine salmon and sturgeon, some local populations of the more widespread trout also suffered. The rich resources of Pinsgauer Zellersee, high in the Salzburg Alps, attracted a group of artisans. They contracted with the archbishop to pay him 27,000 whitefish and 18 lake trout a year for the right to take, smoke, and sell still more. Uh, I should point out these are planktonic uh, eating whitefish that run about that big, that are characteristic of some of the corridonids in, in the Alpine beds. Um, so they had this really good deal. After one human generation, the whitefish catch collapsed, and replacement stockings of pike ate nearly all the trout. Um, so the fishing community determined to rest the lake for three years, and then to fish only with far fewer nets in a limited season and a restricted area. High and late medieval Europeans could thus be well aware of insecurity and shortfalls in the supply of fish and consider countermeasures. Over centuries and under different circumstances, their several responses included privatization and public regulation of fishing rights and methods, purposeful manipulation of aquatic <coughs> systems, and stepwise expansion of fisheries on Europe's maritime frontiers. Privatization of valued fisheries resources, both inland and coastal, accelerated from the 12th and 13th centuries. More strictly enforced private possession of fishing rights, constrained subsistence use by local communities, and imposed greater economic rent on artisanal users. Subsea near also restricted the methods allowed on their private waters. One on the Eiffel demanded fishers keep one foot in the bank at all times. Local conflicts over access became common, eventually generalized in demands by revolutionaries in the German Peasants War of 1525 for free access by the common man to fish for non-commercial purposes. In large public regulation of fisheries from the 13th century onwards was often articulated in terms of conservation and sustainability. Asserting a need to protect the fishery, Sicilian, French, Scottish, and other authorities set minimum size limits, seasonal closures, and restrictions on gear. They assigned enforcement to specialized officials or those generally responsible local and regional public order. The laws not only suggest that some groups with political club perceive changes in status of certain fishes, their locally specific and detailed provisions further indicate practical expertise and experience of fish populations, habitats, and habits. Besides banning search and capture methods on the sovereign water of the Seine, French royal laws of 1268, 1289, and 1291 repeatedly adjusted the size limits for eight essential species in that Roland River. A Pavia ordinance of 1399 forbade cutting vegetation in the Po or Ticino to protect young fish. 1433 regulations from Lake Garda set special closed seasons for Carpiona. When Emperor Maximilian, whom you've met, ordered consultation among his fishmeister, local officials, and holders of fishing rights on the Austrian Danube and his tributaries in 1506 to join together to draft regulations tailored to each region. His proclamation used full-color pictures of eight principal species to ensure unambiguous uh, discussion. Uh, that thing is really about two-thirds the size of what the way you see it set up. Huge. Yes. Uh, <coughs> To judge from known instances of productive inland, productive inland fisheries which did last until the 19th, even 21st century, both private and public management could be effective. Natural productivity, however, remained limited, and the total of traditional freshwater, estuarine, and coastal resources diminished in the face of rising demand. Medieval Europeans further intervened at several levels with intent to manipulate their aquatic systems. Local stocking and species transfer was always an option. One advised in the state management manuals and to be seen in practice from Sicilian lagoons to Yorkshire rivers. From at latest until 1279, the self-governing commune of Perugia, which had lucrative trade to Rome and Florence and fishes from Lago Frasimeno, was actively stocking several species, including trout. If 19th century reports on a now lost manuscript can be believed, about 1400, one French landowner even recorded his experiments with artificial spawning of trout. As pond managers were by then controlling reproduction of warm water fishes, the story is not implausible. Indeed, aquaculture was a major area of medieval innovation, with development, perhaps first in 11th, 12th century France, of ways to manage fish stocks and water together to rear especially cyprinids, pike, and other stillwater species. Purposeful large-scale enterprises spread eastwards by and after 1300. 
now specialize in production of fast-growing exotic carp to ensure elite inland consumers of their fresh fish. Trout are but rarely mentioned as objects of these large-scale fish farms. That is an artificial fish farm. It's not the biggest in Southern Bohemia. Uh, for Moravian churchman Jan Gravius, who in the 1530s prepared the first comprehensive work on Central European fish culture, trout were an afterthought, reared for delicate tasting party treats, not for profit. They required cold running water onto hard sand or gravel substrates and supplemental feeding with carp fried leek or other little fishes. Those given liver or other meat taste badly. In so briefly summarizing key aspects of medieval inland and the coastal fisheries, and much over-representing trout in my illustrative examples, I have meant to make two essential points. The people who then really knew about fish in general and trout in particular gained this knowledge through work. What the fishers, fishmongers, and pond masters experienced in pursuing, catching, keeping, even rearing fish, they stored in memory and passed on by word of mouth. We now call such information traditional ecological knowledge. This understanding, which included local habitats, animal behavior, capture techniques, and the value of conservation measures, passed orally through generations of illiterate medieval fishers. We now know, for instance, the names of multi-generational families of expert fishers of the Zorkadze, and likewise how individuals in the employ of Tegernsee Abbey advanced over the years from helping old fishers to running their own boats. Yet their contemporaries, who possessed literate skills, mainly professional churchmen, long saw little reason to apply their letters to such mundane matters. What changed to encourage transfer of tra fishing traditional ecological knowledge into the literate elite? In the earlier Middle Ages, and notably up to the 12th century, Prevalent attitudes among ordinary and learned Europeans alike saw the natural world as hostile, as a place to struggle for survival against antagonistic material and even demonic forces. Both groups judged the meaning of the physical work required, and the dominant ideological position on the clerical elite made labor both a shameful consequence of mankind's fall into sin, and at best, barely supportive of an essential journey of the body carrying the soul to salvation. While some religious worked, they did so as an act of penance and self-discipline. Thanks to some mix of improved material circumstances and deep cultural changes affecting the European belief system, a more favorable view of this world, the sacral look, and whence our word secular, began with the 1100s to emerge among some articulate Europeans. Incipient changes affected attitudes toward the natural world and towards physical work. Men who would later be called philosophical philosophers and theologians at emerging centers of learning in northern France articulated notions of benign nature, even portraying it as an entity meant to be collab to collaborate with humans to achieve divine plans for a better world. A parallel development saw a willingness among new social groups, students, courtiers, and especially townspeople to consider the natural world a place for relaxation. The poetry of wandering scholars and troubadours reflects this thinking, and so perhaps do the skating outings reported of 12th century Londoners on the frozen Thames. Guillaume Bazoche likely shared this view, as did the 14th century Florentines, depicted in Boccaccio's de Camera as enjoying riding, hunting games, and even fishing in country villas. What medievalist David Hurley he called a recreational attitude toward nature was evidently cultivated by people not themselves compelled to struggle with the material world. In a broadly similar context, the canon view of St. Victor, who led a community of learned secular priests in Paris in the 1120s, offered in his Didascalia a new approach to human knowledge, grouping what he called arts into the theoretical, practical, discursive, and mechanical, all of them needful for human life. Hugh is thus reputed the first Western thinker not to condemn, but indeed to value physical work for its own sake. Among the seven mechanical arts defined as imitating nature by making useful objects, he classified food preparation, agriculture, and hunting, the latter including fishing, with, for example, nets, lines, hooks, and spears. Later medieval educational and moral writers widely circulated Hugh's ideas in both Latin and certain vernaculars. Some generations later, 
Thomas Aquinas and subsequent 13th century theologians. Now considering how Christians ought best to live in their societies, extended Hughes thinking to include physical play as having potential pedagogical, moral, and social values. A virtuous game brought relief to the soul. But what games and activities were this? Certainly not gambling, sexual flirtations, nor for at least some writers, violent nightly tournaments. <laughs> Evolution is play as calling for knowledge and proper behavior had actually begun somewhat earlier with falconry, culminating in the Deate Ganandi Cum Ave was the art of hunting with birds, the art of hunting with birds, which Emperor Frederick II himself, who was a serious falcon, uh, completed in the 1240s. The hunt was on a similar track by 1200, we can see that in some literary text. By the 14th century in France, the chase, a certain kind of hunt, had reached the level of formal written instruction, which was soon copied and emulated elsewhere. These texts and teachings set out the rules of correct behavior by social participants in selected and approved forms of art. Such streams of thought converged in educational and moral advice from secular and religious writers of 15th century Italy. Prominent humanist Leo Battista Alberti urged his fellow Florentines in, four, in his widely read four books on the family to benefit from the fresh air, pure water, and spiritual satisfaction available on their rural estates. A younger contemporary, Giacomo della Marca, a dynamic revivalist Franciscan preacher and inquisitor, emphasized the need to ease tensions of the spirit and of the body. Having identified physical activity called recreatio and bodily solace as an appropriate remedy, Giacomo amplified St. Thomas to specify licit play as avoiding excess under the circumstances, and notably, neither leading to mortal sin, coming before God in religious duties, harming neighbors, causing scandal, encouraging lust, occurring in prohibited places, nor being undertaken for greed. Whether in cities or the outdoors, proper recreation brought moral and physical benefits when done according to certain rules. But when it came to hunting and fishing, the knowledge and skills so properly to enjoy nature were already possessed by people who worked at it. The written record from the later Middle Ages documents transmission of traditional ecological knowledge from an oral to a literate culture. The letter dedicatory to the first printed book on fishing, the Heidelberg Book of 1493, indicates Johann Rittershofen, town clerk at Neustadt an der Harp, had gathered its recipes among local fishers of Rhine tributaries. And a few years later, the Cadence compilation of fishing advice names one, names one informant, Martin Forkel, and alludes to another. The diction and style of both reveal strong oral qualities. So too do the mid-century mid English manuscript of tracts and the printed treatise of 1496 itself. In a passage absent from the earlier manuscript, the latter author pleads unfamiliarity with fishing for carp, but recommends Bates, quote, as I have heard say of persons credible, as well as some written source. The 1577 Art of Angling, the second such printed work in English, uh, also makes cryptic reference to a local, probably church warden, as jealous of his expertise in catching the trout. Maybe that's why there's no flies in that um, The Spaniard Basorto explains his practical advice is, quote, taken from the experience of many and great fishers and from my own. While Gessner in 1558 attributed the knowledge of fly fishing he obtained from his German, book, German booklet as originating with certain skillful fishers. On some of these late medieval occasions, moreover, traditional ecological knowledge of fishing can finally be seen to pass from those who experienced fishes trout among them through work to those who understood their activity as play. Cultural currents of knowledge transfer and sport come together in two texts with special, though not exclusive, enthusiasm for fishing the fly for trout. What could not yet have been even implicit in Schionacher's letters, namely, is now plain in the 1496 treatise and in Basorto's 1539 dialogue. Both now echo the moralists, secular and religious, to establish the value of angling as sport. The treatise begins with the Solomonic proverb that a glad spirit makes a flowering age. It declares that such a merry spirit comes from good and honest sports and games. Dismissing hunting, hawking, and fowling as too chancy and laborious, 
leaves the sporting game of angling as the best for a long and happy life. <coughs> this, says the treatise, unlike other kinds of fishing, brings no cold, discomfort, or other than self-inflicted grief. The text promises to prevent the latter from showing how to do it right. Uh, and even if the waters fail to yield the desired fish, the angler shall enjoy his wholesome walk in nature and benefit in soul, body, and goods from his early rising. And therefore, to all of you that have been virtuous, gentle, and freeborn, he created and invented the simple treatise following, by which he shall have the full craft of angling to disport you at your loss. Following the practical instruction, the final two printed pages, which are lacking in the manuscript of Stevens, actively recall the sporting purpose with a charge to ye that can angle and take fish at your pleasures. Do not poach in privately owned water. Don't break or loot fish traps, break gates or leave them open. Don't use this crafty disport for material gain. And don't go angling with a crowd. Remember your prayers, but angling avoids the vice of idleness. Do not take too many fish, which you could do if you follow the vice. Printer Winkenderwerd added his own editorial note. Were this treatise published as a separate pamphlet, some idle person lacking in moderation might destroy the said disport of fishing. Hence, he has compiled it into a second edition of a larger book directed to gentle and noble men, social, gentle and noble men, social distinctions, moral values, rules. Throughout the debate between Hunter and Angler, which frames Basurto's practical instruction, the Spanish author articulates a well-developed sporting philosophy for an indigenous Spanish tradition of recreational angling. With a rich supply of anecdotes from Spanish and Christian literature and history, the aged fisher confronts the noble young hunter with the social and moral hazards of the chase. Hunting, he continues, is a human activity for the recreation of the body, though also for its danger, and fishing is divine and human, divine in that it saves the soul, and human in that it pleases the body with repose. The angler then moves to the offensive, establishing the superiority of this sport in its balance and its lack of excess. Since the fisherman follows a simple, solitary, and contemplative pursuit, even hearing mass in the morning before setting out, he does no offense to God, to his neighbors, or to himself. Against the jive that nobody had ever heard of princes or nobles who fished, the angler replies with still better precedence than Christ's apostles who fished even after their call. Thus, not only is fishing a recreation, superior to hunting, concludes the angler, the simple pleasures of angler will purify the noble soul for its right task of struggle against the enemies of justice, religion, and Spain itself. It's almost as if a sort of were checking off items of Giacomo de la Marca's list, right? Balance, no excess, no lust, click, click, click. All this is at present for you in fishing. Angle. For Basorto, fishing is indubitably a sport, not an occupation. Angler and hunter alike call it recreation, exercio, deleite, placer. Its purpose is to give recreation to the body, as well as benefit to the soul. <coughs> The old fisherman explains that his long practice of it has guarded him against those vices which harm both. His enthusiasm is unbounded, especially for the patient concentration which the sport demands and which obliterates the worldly care of the practitioner. He forgets fatigue, lack of sleep, whether he has slept, even his beloved if he has one. In fact, that very feature of the past day poses its own dangers against which its fanatics must be warned. Yet in truth, it's not unreasonable to advise those who work that they should not go fishing at all good fishing times because they're absolutely felt in their households. Nor should clerics go every day, at least not before finishing with what they owe God and saying their mass and reciting their hours. Nor should lawyers uh, for the harm that they will do to those who have lawsuits. For though this exercise may be absorbed, it's not that in the hands of the man who can give it up when fortune comes along. Only in the context of medieval cultural reevaluations of the natural world, of human work, and of human play, could one form of so common, mundane, and laborious an activity as fishing be so redefined as an art or a craft, and acquire moral value, secular or spiritual, that would secular and spiritual, that would justify active transfer of its essential knowledge of aquatic nature from those who experienced it through work to those who encountered it through their play. My guess when it comes to trout and flies, the latter describes most of us in this room, who thus stand at the end of a long and evolving cultural heritage. Thank you very much.
I'm going to invite you to uh, go out to um, our reception following, although um, Dr. Hoffman is perfectly willing to stay and answer questions if you'd like. I thank you all for your attendance, and uh, if you've got questions, now is the time to ask them. Yes. Uh, in the very beginning, you were talking about some of the earliest writing that concerned politicians, mm -hmm. and I, I didn't quite uh, catch that. It went a little fast. Sorry about that. Uh, in twelve seventeen, you talked about twelve seventeen, twelve twenty. Mm -hmm. What what exactly is that? What exactly was that uh, written reference? I'm sorry. That, no, that's okay. That is uh, in early sections of an incomplete, very large work of Romance literature by Wolfram and Eschenbach called the Tifa Rule. And he's setting up the story. Is that German? Yeah, it's in German. Um, I don't, in fact, think there is a decent English translation of the Tifa Rule. He's the same author that did the greatest work of medieval German literature with the parts of all. Um, all the real story, all that good stuff. Um, and this is a later work that he died before he completed. It was then completed by a much more pedestrian author, who also refers to the Paderama a couple of times because it makes a nice metaphor for something that goes pretty, but has a book <coughs> inside. Um, and so he is setting up this rural idyll of this young nobleman with his girlfriend, and she's sitting on the bank and reading a book, and there's a dog sitting around that will turn into the trigger for turning this into a tragedy. Um, he is, precisely as described, standing in the water without his shoes on, up with, his, with his bare legs, in the running, clear water, blah, 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 fishing with the fader, catching trout. And, he's not really fishing, he's catching uh, <laughs> trout and grayling uh, with the artificial fly. Um, both from himself, hanged out around uh, some of the Bavarian courts and also has connections up in the Purigerwald. Um, I have actually fished on a river that I could imagine people from could himself have fished as Bavaria for and stuff for airport, and we know he spent some time in airport. Um, what was the name of It's the Vera, W-E-R-R-A. Um, these rivers come out of some of those low mountains that occupy portions of the center of Germany. Uh, most of them still have trout, some of them still have grayling if the cormorants haven't gone. Uh, and uh, this is again one of the places where we can subsequently document these recipes for how to make artificial flies. So we have this, in a sense, we have four or five references to the figure on itself in this literary stuff. And we have these lines describing somebody actually doing it. And nobody has done anything like that for a thousand years. The early, early, only earlier reference we have is Galen, who is this weird Roman writer who says, I have a funny story about some strange things that people do with fish. And one of the things is these people on some river in Macedonia, uh, and he gives a name for it, uh, uh, when the fish are eating these bugs, and they, if you put the bugs on a the hook, they don't work. So they take wax-colored feathers and red wool and put them on and they catch the fish. Galen doesn't probably don't have any idea what he's talking about but he does give us his report. And then for a thousand years, we have absolutely nothing. If somebody finds some great, we will publish it, we will make a big name for this. Um, and so then we have, just after 1200, we have uh, Wolfram's report, uh, Wolfram's references, and then within another couple of human generations, we started to get the run of these various kinds of legal and other records in South Germany. Um, where reference of the fader on the fader shoe, the fly with the line with the fly on the end of it, um, are being used. And by the time we get to the age of Maximilian, whom you've seen, um, there are probably 75 or so known references. And it'd be more if somebody wanted to go chase after them. Uh, but they're scattered all over. The and the problem is nobody's done that kind of research, frankly, for England. So we only have these how to do it treatises. I know he's that kind of research for Italy, so we only got that painting. Um, and nobody's really done that kind of research for this for Basorto for Spain. We do have stuff subsequent to Basorto for Spain, including the so-called Astorga manuscript, which contains some 47 fly patterns, 
uh, from North Korea uh, that are written down um, in a city on the lower, on the south slopes of the, of the Pyrenees uh, in 1624. So we got lots of that kind of stuff. But in terms of our record, we start with uh, both of Yes? Uh, what is the origin of the word angling in reference to fishing? I never could understand that. And when did it come into use? Um, it's an English, well, it's both an English word and the German word's the same, angum. In both instances, it derives really from the hook. In uh, England, it tends to transfer over to the rod. Okay. okay. And in both instances, we start seeing that verb um, being employed in, I'd say, some of these 15th century texts. Right. There? Oh, we have, yes, right. Uh, two related questions. Mm -hmm. For most American fly fishers, casually, only casually familiar with the history of fishing, we think of Isaac Boyd. And it, it might be because of its prejudice that's in the source. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if there's a similar prejudice. All of your references are European. No, there's much English stuff in there. Oh, no, I oh. mean, European, including England. Ah, right, okay. Well, is, is there any historical reference to anything that apply from the Arabs, the Japanese, the <coughs> Uh, to my knowledge, nobody's, there's nothing in classical at all, to my knowledge. <coughs> don't know if anybody's book, but I come around and don't think so. That kind of play, I don't think more. Um, hunting play comes through that way. Um, there may be something made in Japanese, but the question of what's going on is very, very hard to ascertain. Um, the Chinese situation is one with some potentially greater possibilities. Right? But then again, working with Early sources for traditional China requires very specialized culinary skills, which I have not. <laughs> um, historians come in packages that are largely defined in terms of the language and archives that they work in. I'm a medievalist. Medievalists work in a world in which modern day packages in Europe don't quite fit, and so many of us become sort of polyglots. Uh, and so I'm quite happy to chase around and work with material anywhere where people were working with Latin characters. I don't go outside. If you don't use Latin characters, somebody else can work on you. I know. Um, <laughs> so now, now, there are other references to studies in other areas. No, there, there are none. Now, there's another, there's another very important substantive response to this, and that is the tradition of fly fishing and sport fishing that we are part of it grows out of the European tradition. It grows out of a variety of European traditions. I grew up in Wisconsin. Um, those of you who may have one-time Pennsylvania connections, uh, you know that your uncle used to fish in all sorts of weird, interesting ways, some of which I can document for fourth century parts of Central Europe. Um, in other words, we do have a body of, of traditional ways of handling fish, both recreationally and in commercial ways, that derive from European traditions with a little tiny bit of native North American traditions added, with possibly a little tiny bit of African tradition, but none of that is going to do with fly fishing. I mean, this is this is who we are, uh, and I'm that's what I work. <laughs> uh, I would be very very happy to have some sinologists come along, come along and, and do the Chinese stuff. I think that's. I asked the question because yeah. I, I visited Hokkaido many years ago mm -hmm. and fished a couple of while I was there, and. That seems, tench never come to the surface. Little bubbles come to the surface from tench. Um, yeah. Recreational fishing, fishing has a, an activity not intended primarily for the school. It's certainly present, in, we know this to be present in both Chinese and Japanese culture. Uh, the fly side. We also know for the Japanese stuff that in the 19th century, Japanese picked up a whole lot of European stuff because it, it modernized, civilized, all that kind of stuff. Um, just as in the 19th century, you will get English fly fishermen showing up in Germany and even writing books that say there's no fly fishing in Germany. When in fact, inside the book, they were saying I was out on the river and I ran into this guy and he was fishing with feathers. But it's not his elite form of fly fishing, so it doesn't 
cup. It doesn't exist uh, uh, as a really annoying Englishman named Parks uh, who wrote this book. First, he calls it the first book about how to fly fish in Germany. That's because he really had not pay much attention to Germany. He married a woman in Weimar uh, uh, after having served for a couple of years in the British, in the British Army in the 1840s. Um, the funny story about him is he's in Weimar, he's an outdoorsman. Seems like he's also a remittance man. He's seen very good work. Um, and he is teaching his grandson to shoot. And they live on the third floor of an apartment building in downtown Weimar. And um, he sets up a target in the window and starts shooting at it. He practically nails the artist who's running art class in the third floor across the street. And he didn't apologize, which made the artist really unhappy. <laughs> um, so there is a, an English prejudice that says nobody else really does it. And they go, no, total, why not? <laughs> But our tradition grows out of, our practices grow out of what started out as European culture. And that is what I work with. That is what I work with. Do you want to follow well, up? Um, no, no, follow up. You had a picture of women in the court. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. a lot of women. Yeah. And that's what I think. Um, I've got a piece that's sitting in the form of a blue folder um, with a bunch of notes in it that is someday going to be a piece about, about, about women in the fishing. Um, there's a whole lot of strange association with very high-ranking women in the um, 14th, 15th century. I only gave you a couple of examples. There's one of Beatrice Estes. She's the wife of one of the um, sports of Dukes of Milan. And she's out at a country place, and she runs the net and catches a whole bunch of fish, and then they do up a picnic, and the court is having these world <laughs> fish. I, I, I can't figure it out. As you say, it, 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 we've got a, some possible hint of this in England, but nobody's really looked. We've got some associated with the French queen. She happens to be a Bavarian. Thus, that Dutch court is actually the business box that's a Bavarian connection. Um, some of the other stories are just over the Alps and it's Tyrol. Now, Tyrol isn't preparing to necessarily get along, but the culture is much the same. Uh, but then it flows down into northern Italy. And whether it's all associated with some of these high court women, very hard to tell. Some of the um, wall pictures that were known to exist in the late 19th century no longer exist anymore. There's another one in which all I've got is a photograph done in the 1920s or something where the pastor was peeling off. And, uh, I looked at it and said, no point in showing it to these people. You won't even believe me that that's yeah. um, There's something there, and I don't know what it is. Because over on the working side, women are very rarely engaged in artisanal fishing. They are very commonly engaged in the marketing side. And that's a pretty clear gender division of labor there. On the subsistence side, women and children are the principal users of, the, of fishing by piscicides, which you do in the summertime. You use these herbal things. Water levels are down, streams are flowing very slowly. And you take a big eddy pool where it's not moving around at all, and you put this stuff in, and then you stand down below and take out the fish. Uh, and it works. I mean, there, there, these are, there's a toxicological pro uh, um, material in certain uh, plants. Uh, this will work. Now, don't try it around here. It's highly illegal. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you about the magical ones, because they involve hair and bones, uh, which is also highly illegal. Um, but I want to test those. So yeah, women, women should be are, are around. There's nothing wrong with the notion of women fishing. Mm -hmm. uh, I still cannot figure out where it fits because so much of the evidence is this odd, deeply interconnected set of pictures and written reports about the, the same set. Probably people want to keep, but take one more. You had your chance. <laughs> okay. Oh, you. I want to call on you if nobody else needs to come. In. Anybody else? Otherwise, he gets a second shot, and then we get to have to do it. Go ahead. <laughs> All right. Uh, I've read a little bit about the book of St. Alphonse, mm -hmm. the 1496, the second edition, and supposedly written by this requirement of an abbey. These records don't exist with her. That's correct. She is a mythical beast. Okay. And okay. then who is that person, and who wrote those books? Okay. Book of St. Albans occurs in two editions. The first one doesn't have any fishing in it. Right. The second one does. In the first one, there is um, a tract on hunting 
which is about 100 years old by the time it appears in that book. And there, there is a passing reference to a Juliet. There is no reason to believe this person ever particularly existed. There is no reason whatsoever to believe that any person of this sort compiled the treatise on fishing. She is a mythical beast. She really only is constructed 150 and more years later, partly because um, Tudor, Stuart period antiquarians are discomfited by anonymous works. So there's a lot of construction of authors for works. Um, modern day medievalists are quite comfortable with the, with the idea that a work is anonymous. It's fun to try to find the person who it might be who put it together. But we don't have any trouble talking about a text for which we do not have a model. We also have lots of texts in which there is an author that we know is false. And so there's pseudo Albert and pseudo this and pseudo that. What we have to do is work with the evidence we got. The evidence we got is that there's kind of a, a moving around of traditions moving out of oral into manuscript in England. They seem to break down into a couple of different families. And one of the families of those manuscripts ends up being much of the text, but not all, that ends up being into word prints. And so we can say the treatise that was printed in 1496 is, has a prehistory in certain manuscripts. But those manuscripts are not the only elements of tradition that are floating around in mid-15th century England. And none of those have any real names attached, it certainly as authors. And this is not surprising. Many of this, much of this material, uh, particularly the, the little tracks with which things start, wherever there might be uh, three or four bait recipes and then maybe a couple of fly patterns, um, will be written in the fly leaf of some kind of a book that we know we can take by hand. Um, their household manuals, their uh, tracts on medicine, uh, and there's a couple of blank leaves toward the end of the codex, and somebody wrote stuff in, in the back. Uh, and we can usually date the hands fairly well, or we know the binding, or whatever, and we can tell from, let's say, the, the, the dialect, paleography, uh, that these things are of a, roughly a certain date. Uh, some of my Federer recipes from, from Germany of uh, German-speaking lands, crop up in three or four otherwise quite independent manuscripts. Uh, it's, and I believe in that case it's because this is in oral knowledge, and it's been passed around orally, and then somebody in Saxony writes it down, and somebody in Bavaria writes it down, and somebody somewhere else writes it down, and they're, they're more or less the same thing. So the treaty could have been originally in another language? No, I don't think so. No, no, no. Um, one of the things about it is none of there's some uh, record sources about people doing this stuff that is in Latin. But none of the manuscript tradition is in Latin. It's all in the vernacular. And as those vernaculars emerge as written languages in the course of later Middle Ages, it becomes much, much more difficult for knowledge to cross because now there's a linguistic barrier. When it was when everything that was written was written in Latin, you could get somebody living up on the Baltic who could read something written by somebody in Rome. But if the guy in Rome is writing in Italian and the guy in the Baltic knows German and Polish, there's no knowledge transfer. And all this fishy stuff uh, about how to do it sort of, um, is in the vernacular languages. Uh, with one very strange exception, the, the French material has never, never been pursued carefully. Somebody can do that. Um, there is one, the earliest printed book on fishing in French was printed in Lyon in 1540 something. And the people who originally were working with it, oh, this is very strange, this is a strange and interesting, wonderful book. And there are these weird words we don't understand. They must be Savoyard dialect. Um, they're not, they're actually German. <laughs> this book is a translation of the tract that was printed in Heidelberg in 1493. Um, and somebody in German who wasn't very good um, turned it into this weird version of French. Which tells us that a very acute printer knew that he had a market for a book on how to catch fish, and he didn't know about any books in French. So he got somebody to translate this thing into French so he could flog it. Uh, and in the, in the 
first chapter of, of, of a Christian Crafting Letter Art, I take the multiple printings of this tract and look at how they grow out of one another, where they are, and how they show us these printers as really pretty sharp entrepreneurs of tailoring and changing the text over and over again for their purposes. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if Winter de Wert didn't do much of the same thing. I mean, he certainly added that conclusion. Um, but we can't tell. We can talk about how the world around here is working, but then we have this case. Oh. And what's before it, we've pieced together from the fragments. There is no great long collection of documents about medieval fishing, except in my own database. <laughs> uh, you have to do the, do the research. Uh, which is what doing history is all about. <laughs> I think we're supposed to go eat chocolate. <laughs>